have an unidentified flying object. I'm Jack Osborne, and you're listening. This is Hudson Hammond, and you're listening to... I'm Richard C. Hoagland, and you're listening to... I'm Art Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. We have an unidentified flying object. Welcome back to another episode of Researcher on a Mission. That's right, R-O-A-M Radio. I am your host, Dr. J. And as always, we have an awesome show for you today. But today is an extremely special show because we're featuring featuring a world-renowned author, a world-renowned lecturer, a TV personality, and a hospice volunteer. And I guarantee you, everybody out there listening knows this name, and it is the one and only Danian Brinkley. Mr. Brinkley, it is an honor to have you on. Dr. J, it's an honor for me to take part and participate in what you're doing. I thank you so much because the education that we're going to provide with the listeners, as well as speaking about your upcoming lecture at the Conscious Life Expo, is always truly one of a kind. And nothing is ever a repeat with you because you're constantly helping people reach the other side. And that's what I was going to plug in first is... Conscious Life Expo, that is coming up February 6th, 7th, 8th, and the Monday lectures are on the 9th. One of the keynote speakers listeners is, of course, Stanion Brinkley. It's Los Angeles, specifically at the LAX Hilton, and you can go to ConsciousLifeExpo.com for more information. And before we go on to what Mr. Brinkley is going to speak about there, what I was going to do is, if for those of you who heard of him, but uh, I don't know the full story. We're going to go back and get the backstory before we come into the current times. Now, Mr. Brinkley is a true one of a kind because he has proved that we can connect with the other side. He has literally solved murders, literally cold cases has helped found children that have been lost simply because he's able to connect with the other side and use consciousness. Let's go back to 1975, Mr. Brinkley. Tell us what happened then at your first NDE or short for near-death experience. Okay, Dr. J, just call me Daniel. Okay. 1975, I grew up in South Carolina, and, you know, religiously everybody goes to hell in South Carolina because of the fundamental nature of that. So I grew up a tough guy. I'm a big guy and I'm tough. I grew up not believing so much in any kind of religious context, and I was a fighter and a football player, and then I went into the Marine Corps, and then I worked for various government agencies under contract. So my life was pretty much set. On September the 17th at 7.05 p.m. in 1975, I was talking on the telephone. I was struck in the head by a bolt of lightning. It followed the phone line down. It hit me just in the side of the head above my ear, and it went down my spine, and it welded the nails of the heels of my shoes to the nails in the floor. Think about, Dr. J, how much electricity had to have passed through me to weld steel to steel. It grounded me, it threw me out of my shoes, suspended me in the air, and it slammed me back down on the bed. Dead for 28 minutes. Completely paralyzed for six days, partially paralyzed for seven months, two years to learn to walk and feed myself. In the course of that, I discovered that no one ever dies. It does not happen. And once you have what is now classically known under the context of Raymond Moody, the near-death experience, which Raymond Moody wrote in Life After Life in 1975, the thing that most people don't know about me is that I was taken to the hospital where Raymond was a medical student. When they brought me in the hospital, it said, patient unconscious, patient not breathing, no EKG. That pretty well tells the story. But what I discovered is I lifted out of my body. I became consciously aware and heightened senses. But you have to keep in mind this, Dr. J. When I got struck by lightning, I was burning and I was on fire. The fireball in the room burnt my eyes so bad I could not see, I could not move, and it was though I had consumed battery acid. At that point, I lifted out of my body. There was no pain. I could see and I could move. And there was a sense of presence and a sense of comfort and a sense of magnificence that surrounded me. But the thing that was most interesting to me is I became an observer of what once and then was my life. I was no longer participating in it. It was like watching it on big screen television. I was floating above my body. I watched what was going on. 
And, you know, I've never heard of the near-death experience. Raymond had not written his landmark book, and it got written up in the newspaper because I was a famous football player in that particular area, and blah, 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 blah. And Raymond and I got together, and Raymond was the first person who had ever come that asked really good questions. I never talked about it because how are you going to get people to even understand it with no framework? And so I lived and traveled through these dimensional, this dimensional reality. I went down the tunnel, came into a place of light. I met by a being of light. And I had what was now known as what the near-death experience is. But the thing that people have to take into consideration was 13 years later, I had to have open heart surgery from damage done to my heart by the lightning. And I had a second near-death experience. The first was a death experience. The second was a near-death experience. And I had the same situation. It was structured the same way. I had the panoramic life review, which I sincerely believe is the most important lesson that humanity can learn from this experience. And then again in 1997, because of complications from lightning and open heart surgery, I had to have brain surgery. I went into surgery for, for four hours. I spent 41 hours in the recovery room. I came awake and had a massive grand mal seizure and was put in the neurocardiac ward on life support. And I had a third near-death experience. So when you look at over a 22-year period, I had three of these. I looked at it each time, and from the first one, I understood its mechanism because if you kill me, I get very interested in the subject matter. And from the next two, I began to explore it. What all this led me to was to become a hospice volunteer, and I created the Twilight Brigade, which is the, one of the largest end-of-life care volunteer programs for dying veterans in the history of this country. I have 32,000 hours at the bedside. I've been with 2,008 people going from this world to the next, and I've been with 340 taking their last breath. So not only do I know what's next, I know what's happening on the pathway to that gate, and I dedicated my life to making a difference and informing people about that they don't die and to lose the fear and to create art forms of closure for those who you love and those who love you. That's my story, Dr. J. Obviously, this opens up our consciousness to an, a new light. I have a question. Do, you, do we need to have a near-death experience to, to be able to... Obviously, we'll understand if that happens, but is there a way we could unlock our consciousness in our brain to be able to have this ability without actually visiting the other side? Absolutely, without any doubt. You come to the Conscious Life Expo. What you do is you come and you pick subject matter. There's probably 100 speakers. You come and realize that not everybody, everybody can give the same message, but some people get it from other people. I mean, a lot of people, if you're basically a jerk, then you can get it from me because I come from that level. But then the information that helps you believe in your spirituality, and then you practice, you practice, you find some form of service. And in the course of that form of service, you find that what are the needs? Like for me, where my empathic skill came from is because I truly decided once you have a near-death experience, Dr. J, only one thing becomes important. You will see your whole life pass before you in a 360-degree panorama. You will watch it from a second-person point of view as though you were your own best friend. Then you will literally become every person that you've ever encountered, and you will feel the direct results of your interaction between you and that person. And then the system of measurement. This is a Danianism. But if God could not come today and God sent you, in the life you just reviewed, what difference did you and God make? If somebody would understand and realize what I just said is what's next, then their life changes at that moment. Because I figured the difference that God and I could make was to be at the bedside and to create a program that people could learn and use so that they could affect the conscious changing and help those who are in a place of making a decision that is the right decision for both the person in transition and for the family members who stay behind. I like conscious life exposed Dr. J because I go and listen to people speak. I listen to them because there's always something you can learn. And it was like you had mentioned earlier, the mainstream media cannot allow you to understand the empowerment of your spirituality. You know, this is the issue. So the alternative media, 
which is where you proudly serve, creates the opportunity for people to get information, and the alternative nature of the conscious life allows people to come and meet people with like-minded ideas to explore the potential and possibility. I mean, some of those people are just as crazy as ticks, but most of them are sane and caring. And not only that, there are booths. You have people who are coming who bring information, tools, and resources that can help you better understand your spiritual nature and drive your empathic capability to use these senses that we all have. Mine just came from that I'm not afraid of being dead. I always say some people are enlightened. I was enlightening. What you mentioned about the Conscious Life Expo, you made so many important points. First of all, you're right. Well over 100 speakers. It's closer to 175. Over 200 vendors. Thousands of people will be there over the weekend. I don't know if it's over 5,000, over 10,000. Usually, usually around 12,000, 12 to 15,000. And as you mentioned, of course, and this can be applied to any group, there's always going to be a small portion of people that are there for the wrong reasons, troublemakers, or uh, not on necessarily with what they're saying. But the majority of them, as you mentioned, bring knowledge, tools, and curiosity. And every single one of these people that attends, speaks, and even is a vendor is all serving the same purpose. They're all looking for to expand their consciousness, to move forward, and to learn about our spirituality and our soul. You brought up a very important point. You are no longer afraid to die. I have to admit this. I am afraid to die. I skydive, and every time I make that leap, no matter how many times, 128 times, I, and it, I still fear what's going to happen if I my parachute doesn't open and I hit the ground. I know I'll probably die peacefully, quickly. But it won't happen. I, no one's going to die. It's nonsense. It's a, it's a ludicrous concept that came into play somewhere in a religious, some kind of religious order created a concept that there was a separation between our spiritual identity and this physical identity. I'll tell you something that's even funnier, Dr. J. No one's ever left heaven. You don't go anywhere. You don't. There is no way, and you can look at it from a quantum physics multi-universe theory, and realize it's impossible for you to have gone anywhere. What people don't understand is that being that they normally meet at the end of the tunnel that are, go from everything from Jesus, Allah, Krishna to Elvis is really their higher self reconnecting with the aspect of themselves. Nobody dies. It's a, it's a complete ludicrous, naive concept that is so religiously driven based on condemnation you know, we're all born in sin, you know, because some some snake talked to some woman in the desert some 6,000 years ago and got her to tell her boyfriend to eat an apple so he could find out he was naked. Do you know how crazy the Adam and Eve story sounds? It's the craziest thing I ever heard. And that we buy into that. And then we we let pharmacology become God. And then we don't real people don't realize that until 1928, when penicillin became mainstreamed in the part of healthcare and we bought into antibiotics, did we ever consciously apply so much fear-based reality into this thing called death? It was inevitable. It will happen. You come here leaving. The number one, Catherine and I, my wife, are writing a new book called 10 Things to Know Before You Go. When you open the book, it says, what's the number one cause of death in America and most other countries? You turn the page and it says birth. And if you're breathing, you're leaving. So if you just took a breath, this book is for you. That's the first three pages. We have to get past this. We are spiritual beings, great, powerful, and mighty spiritual beings. And we have dignity, we have direction and purpose. The only thing that can ever go wrong in a person's life is they allow something to affect their dignity, which is usually a religion an institution, or a government. Then you get addled in your, in your direction, and then you become afraid of your purpose. People live in fear of transition, which is going to happen. It's going to happen. It's part of the process of your spiritual identity manifesting through eight systems to become a human being. And once you become a human being, you separate and appear to be divided in consciousness so that you can think and watch in dualities. In, when you jump out of that plane, that's that rush of learning to fly. 
So you probably somewhere in, in this had some kind of out-of-body experience, and it's trying to recapture those moments. And people who take risk to manifest, to find that place to fulfillment, that's a person that's like you, Dr. J, definitely on a spiritual journey and definitely trying to bring insight and information to people. The same thing that Robert Quixer was doing with the Conscious Life Expo. And I definitely have to applaud him because he does put on an amazing event, and I'm very proud to be helping him this year, not just with the radio promotions, but active promotion, because I truly believe in what he's doing. And I truly believe in what you're doing and what you've done for the people. You Thank just you. proved you just proved to me the soul never dies. And that is something that I've always known. But at the same time, just as you mentioned, mainstream religion has taught us that, you know, we're going to go to hell or heaven, make everything on earth as if it's, there's, there is nothing else. But you made a, a very important comment, and I'd love to ask you about this, that we never go, really go to heaven because we're always, we never leave it because we're always been there. Can you describe what, happens prior to us getting this human body and as some people this is a dual question some people uh, have this belief system that we are on a life a physical life on earth to learn a lesson and if we don't learn that lesson what happens is that we come back to learn that same lesson and then continue to do so but using the same spirit is that what you've sort of figured out or is is that are the people's off because these people have never had near-death experiences but that's karma dr j i mean that's a concept of karma uh, and people forget this you either you're either teaching something or learning something we all get into this we all come to have to learn a lesson i don't buy into that we're either teachers learners or doers and in the course of it i believe there might be a, a hundred million beings spiritual beings that wait at that exact moment of conception or that exact moment of birth to be the one chosen to enter. I believe that we choose a plan, a destiny, our parents. We create situations before to see how well we handle those situations. And in the course of those situations, we're teachers, learners, or doers. You know, there's a kid that starves in Africa. We see it on television and we react. Okay, and we and, and when we see it, we have our prayers or we thoughts or we take action in the physical. And that one little child never knew that it made a difference in bringing consciousness and awareness, and maybe that's all they were supposed to do. I cannot stand brutality and evil, and I grew up as a tough guy, a fighter, and a United States Marine, so I know the game. But when you look at this, and you think you always got to be learning something, they have what's called in the Hindus the Bodhisattva, the, the person that keeps coming to teach, like the Christ consciousness and Buddha and Krishna, all these mythological legends. They come to teach things. So I believe that people can come, and this is something that's new to me, Dr. J. I never was a big reincarnation man because when I talk about the near-death experience and the process before people pass, and sometimes interacting with them after they pass. I speak with authority. I know this. 37 years as a hospice volunteer at the bedside, thousands, not tens, not dozens, but thousands of people I've interacted with. So when I speak of that, I'm emphatic and to the point. When I look at the things that I believe are possibilities and potential like karma or like reincarnation, I have opinions of that. I believe that people can come based on that they can teach something, or they need to take a refresher course, or they need to create obstacles in their life so that they can overcome. One thing about being a great, powerful, and mighty spiritual being with dignity, direction, and purpose, you can never become a great sea captain if you only sail calm seas. So we come here to create all kinds of things that we can overcome and figure out a way to triumph or to support others in their triumph. Now, you mentioned, oh, oh, or we, we, we talked about this a little before we came on, and this was telepathy. And I've always had the opinion that if we were able to use our full capacity of our brain, we would literally be able to connect with other sentient beings, uh, living, non-living, and even uh, animals. We, I would think that we would feel their emotions and understand what they're thinking. And you also mentioned when you went to the other side, you were watching things in a panoramic view. 
which some people these days will label as remote viewing. And I wanted to ask you about those two concepts. I believe, obviously, you have that capability now. So can you tell us a little bit about those before I ask you personally about your experiences with them? Well, I mean, there's no question. Uh, everything is frequency and harmonics, okay? And everything is functioning at the same time. If you look at the work of Rupert Sheldrake in the morphogenic field, which is how he discovered a field of energy, probably from taking some LSD or mescaline or something, that when he was a kid, and he discovered that well, animal, animals have instincts. And think of this. How many animals died in the Thailand typhoon? 200,000 people died, but how many animals? Only oh. those that were in cages or tied up. The rest of them had left that morning and moved up into the mountains. And what was unique is you had every form of animal, foxes and chickens and both traded enemies and food for most of them, and they never touched each other. So their instincts told them that it was time to move. We have these kind of instincts. First, it's poo-pooed on it because the Bible says that these were the instincts and communication with the dead was declared wrong and evil because when the, when the Hebrews conquered the Canaanites, Sumeria, and Judea, the particular religious factors were believing in all of this stuff. Communication among the animals and communication among plants and communication among other ethereal or interdimensional beings. In the Bible, there's two references to communication with the dead. It was considered a sin and an evil, but nonetheless it occurred. And so when the, San the Sadducees and the Pharisees saw that the Jewish culture and nature was sem assimilating into Canaanite, Samaria, and Judea, they declared it evil and a sin, and it became wrong and diabolical, and that evolved into the, the Inquisition, and from that it evolved into the Puritans and the Salem witch trials. And uh, anything that the church could do to stamp out spiritual communication, that means that they would not have control and they set themselves up to be the direct access to God when you are yourself connected ethereally to God, and that's scientifically proven today. I believe in remote viewing. I have no problems. Everything is set up based on an intention. I have been in cases and helping work in cases where I've used that technique, and I've been able to look at these things because when you know you don't die, Dr. J, and you know that you're a spiritual being, and you know that this is just one aspect of your identity, then you explore. You open up your heart and your mind, and you, you take a chance, and you believe in yourself. We all keep hoping that somebody believes in us instead of first setting the standard of believing in ourselves. Catherine and I write about these things, that there are fourfold paths to things. The first is all of their things about love. The biggest mistake people think is what they think about their love. What's your belief system in your love? What keeps people into trouble, Dr. J, is they give their love without attaching a value to it, and they wait for someone to return it before it ever has a value. I've never done that. I mean, even before I had a near-death experience, I've never cared what people think about me. I only care about what I think about them because that's the value of my love and that's how I can control and understand the world around me. I do not live by what other people think because they're not going to be in my panoramic life of you except for me to see how I interacted with them and going from a tough guy to either knocking you out or shooting you to becoming the guy that's trying to figure out how to help and uplift you is the difference that the near-death experience made in my life. Which essentially gave you a, an understanding, wisdom, and brought you to the point of love. See, I've never understood violence. I, I could never, I, when I watch the news, sadly, when I try to not watch them, but when I watch them and I hear of a shooting here or a, a stab fight here, I just can never fathom how people can do that to one another. And I don't know if nothing in my life occurred to have that. I've just always been that way. Well, I was just the opposite. I figure that pain and fear and intimidation were the drivers. I mean, instead of love, compassion, and appreciation, uh, I believe that pain and fear was the driver. I didn't care if you liked me, but you better respect me. And I grew up a tough guy. I'm not afraid. You know, I don't live in fear of anything. And the violence, I understand violence because I perpetuated it, and I was in the Marine Corps. I understand it. 
But that's all about ego control and manipulation. It's not about spiritual unfoldment and identifying the purpose of why you're here. I'm glad you brought up fear because that is an aspect that the government uses to keep people in check. Because fear religions control. and institutions. That's right. That is absolutely correct. We have fear of terrorism. We have fear of nuclear weapons. You, you know, you have fear of going out of your house because you're going to get shot. But I, I don't think people are really as bad. Uh, I mean, obviously there's violence, but I don't think that the world is as bad as the institutions and governments make us out to be. It's all manufactured. It's all manufactured. Terrorism, lone wolves, all that stuff is manufactured, Dr. J. You have to create an enemy. The psychological nature of America is you have to have an outward enemy because that's how you keep people together and that's how you control and manipulate them. I mean, half of this stuff, look at ISIL. This big ISIS, this big terrorist group that's occupying all this territory. But if you look at them, all their weapons are American made. That's right. How can an ISIL guy drive a tank, an Abrams tank, which is so sophisticated and so electronic, and he came out of the, the peninsula of Saudi Arabia or Yemen, and he's driving a tank? And they're American equipment and American made. So I don't have any doubt that we are behind it. They are either MI5 or MI6 or uh, the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Administration. I believe that those are the forces behind it. If I wanted to control oil, and since I've spent years in the Middle East, if I wanted to control oil, then since most of those countries were designed under the Balfour Agreement of, of 1921, and the British drew it off in a map in some gentleman's club, and they did never separate the fact that this is a tribal culture, it's psychology of sheep herders and of that. And they drew these maps and they don't realize that Iraq was part and Iran is part of Persia, Shia and, and Sunni. And if you want to destroy something or you want to control the oil, what you do is you break up the identity of a country. We as the United States are supplying a insurgency group against the country's dictator or leading Assad, and we are training them to destroy ISIL instead of supporting the Assad regime and then negotiating from that. When I look at that, knowing as much as I know about the American system of, of capitalism and control, then I realize it's all manipulated. If you look at American business and you look at what it's all about, if you look at the most successful American business people, they are sociopaths. So it's got this capitalism or this I, 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 me, 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 capitalistic nature that's creating the weapons and the war are about, about successfully becoming a neurotic sociopath. We have billions of, we have people with billions, one percent controls 50 percent of the entire wealth of the world and people are hungry. Here's people worth billions and billions and billions of dollars and have they fed one person? Did they deliver any meals on wheels? Well, that in itself to me tells me that I'm not going to believe anything they say. You know, I'm not going to believe it because I'm like you. I don't trust all that and it's an illusion and my senses tell me that it's a perpetrated, structured nature of fear. That's why I like conscious life. That's why I like being on your show, Dr. J, because we can open up our hearts and our minds and look at reality and explore possibilities from different aspects when we just listen to your show, Conscious Life. And exactly, as you mentioned, at Conscious Life, you're, we're going to have 12,000 plus like-minded people. Uh, I'm going to make a quick comment on two things you said because you really hit the nail on the head. And I want to explain to the listeners that there's no conspiracy behind this. And I'm going to speak first about the CIA and, and bin Laden. We created him as an enemy. And whether people think that's uh, false or not, let me tell you the, the reason why it's not. Exactly. Charlie Wilson, uh, there's a movie about him. He speaks publicly. During the Soviet and Afghanistan war, we were funding the Mujahideen, who was Osama bin Laden. He was with the Mujahideen. We essentially dumped him afterwards. I, and, you know, the typical CIA, we fight him to, to fight our enemies, uh, you know, fund, fund someone to fight our enemies. And when it's over, uh, sorry, we don't know you. But like you said, this was a CIA asset. And what did we do? We demonized him to create an enemy. Uh, one other point I want to make. Who even knows? Who even knows if it was Bin Laden? 
Exactly. I mean, they they named Bin Laden within 36 minutes of 9/11, and he's That's in a right. cave somewhere in Afghanistan. And for this is my personal belief: in order for 9/11 to have happened, you would have to have fooled 11 different government agencies. At least, and remember, this is the part that that bothers me: is people talk about 9-11, oh, the Twin Towers, but what about Tower 7? What about and Tower, day, what about 6? Uh, yeah, what and the day, six? yeah, the day of the attack, if you were watching live television, may, some of the people out there who might remember this interview with the owner, and he basically, using demolition terms, said the Building 7 was damaged, so we had to pull it, meaning he had to demolish it. So are you telling me in the midst of a terror attack, you had time to survey a building, place demolitions, and demolish it while people are being evacuated? It makes no sense. So like you said, at least 11 government agencies had to be fooled. And, uh, I, and from a guy in a cave in Afghanistan with a walkie-talkie, whoever <laughs> believes that. And it's the 28 redacted pages that connect the bin Laden family, but it connects the it's gonna, what it's going to connect is the House of Saud who funded the whole thing, you know, yes. and this, when you look at all that stuff, Dr. J, you start to laugh and you see so many people buy into the story, the whole 9-11 story for me sitting and looking at it from a spiritual point of view, it is impossible for it to have happened the way the government tells me it happened. It is impossible for that to happen. Agree. I was going to say, continue with what you're saying, but I have to agree in so many, so do so many listeners and Americans now. It's insane to think that. No building. Think of it. This is just one point on the subject. Jet fuel. It's kerosene. It'll never get more than 2,200 degrees. Never. Never. Which is exactly why you had the world engineers basically say that it's physically impossible that jet fuel would have brought any of the towers down. It, it, it still won't melt until 4,200 degrees. That's Forget right. Forget it. It won't happen. And the whole thing, this is what's funny to me. And this is funny. When I watch the planes going into the, sh the big show of the planes going into the building and everybody says there's the planes and it shows this picture of the planes going into the building and you see it hitting into the tower, there is no way that could happen. Especially at that altitude and that speed and several pilots have testified to that fact. There is no way it would have just crumbled. It's aluminum against reinforced steel. Do you think a jet wing could make the hole that you see in the side of that building? That's impossible. I definitely agree. And the, the Pentagon is, is, is a bit far out there, too. I mean, to that say that just, they that was That was just a tomahawk or a hurricane. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly what some of the first witnesses said. Another point you mentioned a little bit ago I'd love to comment on is, is the billionaires. This is what I never understood. What can't you buy with $50 billion that you have to go and get $60 billion? Last year, the top 600 billionaires, uh, 400 from America, 100 from China, 100 from, the, from Russia, they increased their net wealth by an extra half a trillion dollars. Five hundred billion dollars more was added to these people's wealth. That's called QE2. It's sad, isn't it? Because as you mentioned, but, where yeah. are they feeding people? But, yeah, because this is what I do. I mean, I feed homeless. I, I get out and I go visit guys and I do hospice work because I believe that I'm not a sociopath. And when I look at this and I look at all the stuff that's going on, then I see the shifting and the changing. People become so obsessed with the, with the nature of who's got the most at the end. I've never seen a U-Haul on the back of a hearse. So when you've been dead like me, you do not attach so much material value. You just don't do it. You don't attach spirit material value to things. You look at things as tools. And this is the whole thing. But th this is what's so great about this, Dr. J. This system that we have called the petrodollar, the ability to create and finance fiat money. It's the Brentwood Dunwoody reserve with the dollar as the reserve currency after World War II. It's over. We'll never pay the debt. We'll come up with a commodities-based power. That's why the United States is so driven to create oil and natural gas. 
because based on the new currencies and the new stabilization of what's getting ready to happen this year and next year, the factor comes into play that what will occur is we would use our strength and value once this system of the dollar passes, which would brick. And all this is happening, the collapse of uh, the euro in Europe, and then when Greece leaves, here we are. What it means is we have to look at inflation. We're looking at an inflationary period that's coming. Second, it's a good thing because it's a way for us to stop, quit living in the ideals of a consumer-based psychology. Think about America. We, we fooled ourselves into giving away our industrial base so we could buy cheap crap on credit. And now we're $18 trillion or $19 trillion in debt. And when you start to think about that, to even believe that we've allowed this to happen is embarrassing. But what's so spiritually wonderful about it is a new order is going to come into play, not a new world order, but a new value of how we're going to base commodities on currency. I think that that shift tells everybody because my presentations at The Conscious Life, Dr. J, have a George Norrie panel. Then I have the review of Chapter 5 in Saved by the Light. In 1994, we were, in 1992 and 93, Raymond was losing the battle about the near-death experience. Scientists had come up with oxygen brain deprivation, temporal lobe seizures, frontal lobe seizures, aphylactic shock, all kinds of reasons except what truly happens. And when I came to see Raymond, I could tell the condition that he was in. Raymond is a wonderful philosopher and a very wise and broad thinker, but he's not tough. So I decided to write a book with Paul Perry called Saved by the Light. And in it, if people know my story, I went to Crystal Cities where I saw boxes of knowledge is what I call them. I didn't know, Dr. J, then they were the future. It was only four years later. But I chronologued the history of America to 2014, and we sit at world war, world peace, and that's where we sit today. And so what I'm going to lecture about and present about is go through step by step the boxes of knowledge and relate them to everyday events so that people can see where they are and they can get a grip on the reality of the next three years without living in a fear-based, control, manipulated society. And then some other information that I've gathered along the way that would be of support and help to them that they could also look at to help show the fulfillment of the boxes of knowledge. The spiritual beings that I encounter understand that the probable possibilities based on free will where we would go. And based on that, I wrote it in a book 20 years ago. And when you start to look and you look at chapter 5 in Saved by the Light, you become remarkably aware of that we are not changing. We're holding on to a mindset. Nothing was carved in stone. But in order to change, we had to realize our spiritual identity instead of our need to amass stuff. I'm glad you brought up the Conscious Life Expo of what you're going to be speaking to because this is a perfect segue. I wanted to spend the last quarter of this interview on what you're going to be speaking. But before, let me back up one second and, and go as as if you're just showing up, as if you're about to go to your lecture and before you present. What happens when you come across new people? Are you instantly connecting with them through their minds? And do you at all times have a, a connection with the other side? Can you be in a group of people and see the living and the non-living? I do it all the time. I don't see a difference. I mean, I, I see people walking down halls in hospitals. And when I'm around a group of people, especially when the energy, what happens is when like-minded spiritual beings get together, the frequency changes, Dr. J, the frequency changes. The response and the energetic interaction between us spiritually begins to heighten. People, people see things and know things that what's normal everyday people because we're all around searching. We're looking and, and being in the presence of that place. So my senses are heightened. I mean, I, if you come to a lecture, you see I interact with people in the audience. I mean, at the end of the lecture, I have time for questions and answers. And it's so easy to find out if I'm capable of reading minds and communicating because in the last part of it, of anything that I do, I open up for questions and then I help people. 
because one, it's one thing to talk about all this. It's another thing to reinforce it, because learning is two things. First, hearing it, and second, it be reinforced. And I want people to leave with less fear. I don't want you to be afraid of dying, but I want you not to be afraid of living. And that's the basic core nature of anything that I do. I'm not afraid of death, and I'm not afraid of pain, because I have endured and lived through all of that. But even more important, I'm not afraid of living. And to be controlled and manipulated like we are, there has to be a battle cry and a rise and a cause where we can come together, support each other, laugh and make fun of each other, enjoy the information that's being shared, and to be able to present a cohesive viewpoint of our spiritual identity in an ever-changing physical world that's happening around us. The veil is thinning. So the separation between the worlds, look at this, the fact that there's been a 700% increase in exorcisms by the Catholic Church in the last 10 years. What is that telling you? I mean, you've got to stop and take a look that the world, the veil that's separating the frequencies and harmonics is separating us from other dimensions and reality or thinning. Look at what's happening. So by being able to come and find your spiritual identity in a place, and any of the speakers are good. I was looking at it the other day. I see people I've known for years, and mine is about reducing fear and being able to have a conscious place to turn that I'm not woo-woo, I'm not off the wall, I'm a hospice volunteer, and I'm a 65-year-old Southerner. And I have been living in the between world for 40 years. This is what I really appreciate about you. Not only are you full of wisdom and, and can wake people up to what's really out there, you are truly a role model by being such a humble, loving person that is truly selfless. And, and really, that is the model that I wish everybody out there was able to follow. And the good thing about the Expo is you have that. You have all those people there that are looking to not only follow that path, but wondering what it's going to take to get the rest of the world on that path. Well, it only takes 3% to convert it. And I believe that that a factor is coming no matter what. The realization of economic collapse is going to bring us all closer together, so I, I embrace it. You know, I embrace this. Because it, when, you, when, the, when the show is over and the so-called collapse comes, it just means we've got to deal with some inflation. Okay, that's what's going to be. And we and we this country has been through this uh, since eighteen since eighteen sixty three, one two three four five times. This is nothing new. It happened in nineteen twenty nine. It happened in nineteen thirty four. It happened in nineteen eighty eight or eighty nine. And so this cycle that we're living in is going to change, but it's going to be so dramatic. We have to be really careful about. And this is something I need everybody to ponder and think about. When the president is asking for War Powers Act, when he's asking for to fight ISIL, it means he has to break Syria in order to take control of Iran. And so to give him the power, to come to Congress to give him the power to go to war against those people, people need to pay attention specifically to what it says in that bill that he's asking to have brought forth to give him. Because we gave it to Lyndon, we gave it to Kennedy, we gave it to Lyndon Johnson, we gave it to George George uh, Herbert Walker Bush, and we gave it to George W. Bush. And look at where it got us. And we're just on a repeat path. And like you said, I'm glad you brought that point up because giving him that power, despite him speaking on the limited scope of what he's going to do. You're absolutely right. It's his end to Iran and other areas that uh, he's that we wanted to get into. And all these all these power acts that we've given to the executive branch and supported through all these presidencies, all they have in common is destruction, death, and and people control. starving. A control exactly control of oil, control of assets. You got to remember. In the modern-day world, there's three gods. There's three gods, oil, gold, and dope, whether legal or illegal. And, of course, it's no conspiracy that the government has been involved in using dope to fund black operations. As a matter of fact, there's a Navy SEAL 
who served in Vietnam, 66, 66 to 69, and then afterwards did two mercenary missions uh, for, the, for the United States, guarding giant cargo ships full of cocaine, one from Peru and one from Colombia. But this is not news. I, I know you know this, and like you said, it's all about I was there. Control. I know the game. I mean, I understand how it works. When they created, because of Nixon and bombing Hanoi and Nixon going into Laos and Cambodia, they created the Senate Oversight Committee on Black Ops or uh, Oversight Committee. So in order to fund black operations, you had to, you could only spend so much money that was in the budget, but then you had to fund these operations. So they've used drugs to create a way that they could fund these programs and keep them off the books. Hey, it's so easy. Watch. Watch, Dr. J. Think about it. When the Taliban ruled Afghanistan, they had 65 tons of opium per year because they couldn't stop everybody. From the time America went into Afghanistan, they've been averaging 6,570 tons of opium. That it brings the value of a gram of heroin from $600 down to $80, and it's more pure. So... We are in there fighting and looking for uh, Al Qaeda, which is a which is an Arabic word that was used by the Central Intelligence Agent, which means the base. So, is anybody that you could find a jihadist or a, a radical that would come fight the Soviet Union in Afghanistan? Well, where is all that heroin going, and how come that there has never been anything done about it? Because it's the same thing as Bermuda. I mean, uh, in Burma. And the same thing as in Vietnam. All of us who were in that particular period of time, we, now they're called contractors. We had a different name in the, in the early 70s. We were, you know, like you said, mercenaries. But now they're called contractors. We have to come to be aware and what the conscious life and you allowing us to be on this show and giving awareness. I invite everybody to come to my programs. I have I have the George Norrie panel, then I have the Danian, which is the, the review, the boxes of knowledge, and then on Sunday I have the near death panel. And I have the best near death experts and people on this panel on Sunday. So I thank you so very, very much, Dr. J, for having me on this show. I hope to come back, and I hope to see you at The Conscious Life. And everybody's listen. Please, everybody, take a break. Come spend some time with some people who are looking for you. You may make a new friend. You may fall in love, or you may find your twin flame or soulmate. But make that as an intention for why you're going to expand your spiritual consciousness, and surely it shall come to pass. Daniel Brinkley, it has truly been an honor to speak to you. Of course, we definitely have to do this again, and I will look forward to seeing you. Everybody out there, I hope you caught what he said about the three panels. They will be truly spectacular. Go to ConsciousLifeExpo.com. Get your tickets now. Pre-sales are discounted. And, of course, uh, you can also go to Dr. J Radio Live. So you can get more information that I'll have direct links as well as the direct links to the shows that you can hear after this broadcast, the live broadcast. You guys can all listen to it again directly on the site. And remember, this show is about you, the listener. You tell me who you want to hear. You tell me what you guys would like to learn. And exactly this is what happened with Mr. Daniel Brinkley. He's been someone that I've been trying to get you because you have asked for him. And now, look, he's manifested. And not only has he brought us wisdom, he has truly shown us what a role model is, a loving, humble, selfless person who helps others. Again, Mr. Brinkley, it has been an honor. Everybody stay tuned for hour two for another amazing show, for another amazing guest in the continuation of the show. With that being said, we'll be back right after break. All right, welcome back to Hour 2 of Researcher on a Mission Radio, R-O-A-M. That's right. I hope you all enjoyed Mr. Danian Brinkley. And now my co-host, Johnny Webb, is joining us for this second hour. And we are speaking to the surprise guest that I told you before we left for a break. And this is Ernesto Ortiz, who wrote an amazing new book, which has just now hit all the bookshelves and as well as Amazon, and it is the Akashic Records, 
sacred exploration of your soul's journey within the wisdom of the collective consciousness. And as you all heard in the coming, in, in the recent weeks, and even this last hour, the importance of consciousness. Now, I know you're out there listening, primarily look, looking out for, for UFO shows or other stuff like, like that, but I'm sure you've noticed that every single one of the guests recently, ranging from the Honorable Paul Hellyer, former Defense Minister of Canada, to uh, Dr. Stephen Greer, to even Jim Mars, to Paula Harris, Colin Andrews, and so many others, even Grant Cameron, have all picked up on the consciousness. And I've always been saying this. The scientists cannot separate the hard science from spirituality slash consciousness because consciousness is clearly the missing link. And Mr. Ortiz did an amazing job on really writing a very comprehensive book on the Akashic Records and the consciousness. And with that being said, it is a pleasure to bring Mr. Ortiz in. Ernesto Ortiz, welcome to the show. Thank you so, so very much. It's a, a real pleasure to be here with you and uh, talk about consciousness or anything else for that matter with you and your radio listeners. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Oh, it, the honor's all ours. You've done an amazing b job with your book. I've uh, that The reason why I waited a, a bit to, to have you on is so I can go through the book. And, and I, I honestly think it's a truly fascinating one. And everybody out there listening at the end of the interview will probably will feel the same exact way and would, I suggest, would love to get their hands uh, on it. But before we dive into the book and, and ask you the main question of what are the Akashic Records, let's tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. What got you onto this path? Um. Uh... Well, I think uh, positive karma, really, you know, I, 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 it was never a conscious decision for me to say, I'm going to get into the exploration of the mind. Uh, I am going to get into the exploration of shamanic cultures from around the world, the exploration of consciousness and uh, spirituality. It was really never a conscious choice. What happened is that I was fortunate enough to be born in a very well-to-do family in Mexico, and they own coffee plantations. So we spend all of our vacations at the ranch, the, the Hacienda house. And right there, instead of gravitating to stay in the house with my cousins and, and learning how to play chess and how to be a proper little boy, I ran outside, kicked off my shoes, and I wanted to be with the workers. Now, with the workers, uh, farm workers, I learned how to pick coffee, and and they took me in at first, I guess, because I was the son of the landlord, landowner. But after that, they saw a genuine interest for what I was witnessing, and they took me in. So from the time I was 8, 9, 10 years old, I watched the, fo the folklore of this beautiful, delicious uh, culture in, in Mexico, and it was rich in mysticism and shamanism. I didn't know what at that time what name to call it. I was just simply witnessing the the men and the woman, the shaman of the of the tribe, so to speak, doing rituals and ceremonies, cleansing ceremonies with people. They were doing it to me as well. So I, my family were medical doctors and dentists and bankers and that sort of thing. So I was exposed to this duality of, of not only culture, but uh, belief systems. And for whatever reason, I truly embraced the, 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 what I was witnessing with this with these people. And I remember distinctly at age 12 when the shaman of the, of the group was doing a cleansing ceremony with an egg on this woman. And when he finished and cracked the egg, what came out was black and dark like molasses. And at that particular moment, I said to myself, that is so cool that I want to learn how to do that. Now, I didn't know what that was. But I just knew that whatever I had witnessed at that moment and for the previous four, five, six years, that I wanted to learn how to do that. So what I did with that 
statement, you know, that affirmation is I open a door or a window within my own mind, my own consciousness for the law of attraction to start playing out in my life. And what that means is that the conditions and circumstances, the right people start showing up in my life for me to continue following that path. And uh, so the path of, 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 of diving into the mystery, into the unknown, has been always there for me. So, you know, that's why I said that I never really made a conscious decision. It just simply happened. And the only thing that I have said is yes to life. I have never negated uh, negated life and whatever life presented and put in front of me, as long as I could learn it, assimilate it and utilize it in my life, I, I go for it. So I have had uh, countless, countless experience experiences of mind expanding uh, situations in which I have been able to deeply connect with the mysteries of the earth, the mysteries of the universe, the mysteries of all there is at the level and capacity that I have within myself. And the only thing that I have is turn around and share that with others. So that's what I do in my life. I, I want to comment on two things you said, which are very key. Just like you said, you didn't start out uh, purposely looking to for consciousness. It just you, you, it led you to that. And that is exactly the point that I was making earlier with all these UFO researchers. Grant Cameron, take him, for instance, from 1975 to 2013, he was nothing but hard evidence, paper files linking White House and, and presidents to UFOs. And something happened where he realized the missing link to everything is consciousness. And that is exactly what I get the same path from you. You've obviously had something in your life that triggered that you realize that the path of consciousness is, uh, is, is important because I truly feel it is the missing link. The collective consciousness, our ability to, to have this uh, collective consciousness that we can tap into and have unlimited resources and so much more. And one little other comment I want to make about what you saw with your egg. I'm Greek Orthodox, and I recall a couple times in my life where my uh, family took me to, I guess you would say a shaman. There, we, we, there, we use a different term in, mm -hmm. in Greece uh, and, and, you know, for the, for the Greek equivalent of a shaman slash witch or whatever you'd like to call her. Right. And to remove a, a curse or to see if a curse is on you, they basically did the same thing with taking an egg and rubbing it, uh, uh, you know, starting from the head, going down and praying. And then at the end, breaking it open. And if it was dark, then you apparently had something on you versus if it was uh, clear. So I, I love that that you mentioned that because I can uh, completely relate. Now let's dive into the all-important book, the reason why I brought you on for this interview, the Akashic Records. What are the Akashic Records? The Akashic Records are a field of infinite and unlimited potential that is within our reach. This field has been accessed by many, many mystics and, 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 and psychics from all over the world. Here in the United States, we know about Edgar Cayce as being uh, a prophet that used uh, the Akashic Records with his psychic abilities to connect into this field and obtain information for his healing cures. Uh, we have uh, Nostradamus, you know, everybody has heard about him, as also is, is stating that he used the Akashic Records, Alice Bailey and countless others that have used this field. So what in a more linear way of looking at this, uh, the Akashic Records are uh, the progression of our soul's evolution from the time of its inception to the present moment. So in in the Bible, for example, they are mentioned as in the book of Revelations as your book of life. And it is also said that in the last days, that book will be open. Well, we are in those last days. And that's why I believe that we have a dispensation that is now that we can all have access to this Akashic Records. So the Akashic Records, can I, I can also say that they are, or what I call them, I should say, is the Library of Congress of the Soul. 
And what that means is that every thought, every imprint, every action that we have in life is recorded. And it goes into this field known as Akasha. It goes into our book of life.